so we're talking to a dear friend of mine, Ronnie Cuz Strickland. You know him as Cuz uh, from Mossy Oak uh, Hayes Outdoors. Cuz, we started this off. First of all, thank you for joining us on Deer Talk Now. Hey, well, thank you for asking. I, I feel like we're sharing camp again. It's been too long. It's been way too long. And I'm looking at that photo behind you, Bent Creek Lodge. I've never been there. I've heard a lot about it. But that's got to be 1980s. Yeah, that was like 87 or so. It was uh, it was the first event I ever did as the PR guy for Mossy Oak. And I brought in uh, Will Primos and Toxie and Harold Knight and David Hale. There was a, it was a good, good group of celebrities back then. And I brought in some big time outdoor writers there. I think Nick Sisley was there, Mark LaBarber. And the day we were going to, the season opened on Saturday and that night we had everybody in camp and all that. And I literally could not sleep. I, I, I drove around, walked, I was so nervous. And the next morning, I sent everybody out to go hunting. They had a celebrity caller and a guide, and I just rode around. And I came back to camp about nine or so. And as I was pulling in the camp there, I saw a flash, and I looked over, and there was already somebody there taking pictures. And I looked at another 100 yards. There was another person taking pictures, and that. And every single rider was already back wow. with a de- with a dead turkey. You you talking about the weight of the world coming off your back? Because uh, you know, as a as a guy that was putting those on, you can control a lot of stuff: the food, the atmosphere, the camp. But you can't control the hunting. But I really wanted them to get a turkey, and that was like divine intervention it was the coolest hunt ever so that is awesome now if you guys if you don't know cuz you haven't watched much television because he is uh one of the pioneers uh mossy oak um and you can correct me on some of this cuz if i'm wrong but i'm pretty sure mossy oak was the first uh major i i mean i know mr crumley started uh tree bark and i've got stories that are related to deer and deer hunting on how that all happened but uh, that was in 86 when Toxie started that company, basically, and it's because hosts, it's called a fistful of dirt podcast. We're going to tell you about that later, but uh, he started with a fistful of dirt and some sticks, started that camouflage company. And that's like one of my first questions, cause is how did, cause we know what Mossy Oak is today. Mossy Oak is a, it's a legendary brand. You've got, and I had to write this all down. It's kind of like us, but on a much, much larger scale, you've got biologic, you've got native nurseries, you've got um, Mossy Oak properties, Mossy Oak fishing, Mossy Oak team sports, Mossy Oak gamekeepers. How did that all start from a little camo company? And what, you know, what did that all mean to, to this hunting industry? You know, it's uh, and people think you're you're making this stuff up, but literally, Toxy, uh, his dad was in a club down near Mobile, uh, called Choctaw Bluff, and it was one of the few places around way back then that had turkeys. And Mr. Fox, Toxy's dad, used to take him down there, and their their routine for turkey hunting, they build a real elaborate blind, sticks and leaves, all that stuff. And Toxy. Uh, he, he said, oh, man, one of these days I'm going to fix some camouflage where I ain't got to do all that. And he literally, he was working at Brian's Foods. That's a, it was a big company. They eventually sold to Sarah Lee, but his dad was the, he was the livestock buyer there. And Toxie was trained in marketing, although he started out there on the floor somewhere. And uh, he literally saw, I, I, I'm assuming what was available out there and, there's a picture somewhere of him. He took dirt and leaves and these little twigs, and he went to a, a guy that converted fabric, and he had those. He said he was asking him, could he match those colors? And the guy just laughed at him. But that's that's where it started, and they eventually got that done with the right colors, and he bought not even a full roll of material. I don't know how I many. It was maybe 600 yards or something. And his mother hand sewed, and she hand sewed a couple of outfits, and uh, Toxie wore it a little bit, and his uh, he finally got some help to cut and sew. All that took place right here. Wow! And he bought a he bought a tiny little lab in Mississippi Game and Fish, 
and uh, that's, that's kind of where it started. And uh, it was uh, phenomenal. I, he, he and Bill So Bill So was the first employee. Me and Bob Dixon and his bookkeeper were right in there in line. But the first trade show they ever went to, their first year, this would have been '86. Uh, I had I was there, and I was actually buying archery stuff, not only for the store I was working at, but also the NBS because the archery was really new back then and my wife was there with me and she come got me and she said there's some guys down here in the basement and a little 10 foot booth from mississippi that have a camel pattern and i wow i went down there and saw it and met them and i'm sure i wrote one of the first orders for the store i was working in and he he had some of those where's waldo pictures so i took some of my own and put them in the store and I, that stuff was just selling, selling, although it was 100% cotton made in the USA. And Toxie called me one day and he, he said, because you're selling more than we are. And uh, I want you to come to work for me. And that's where that started. I had been working. I'd worked for Will Primos for a year, yep. but I couldn't I couldn't move to Jackson. That, I had little kids and all that. But it was fun watching Toxie because he was always the marketing genius to me he was always three or four innings in front of us in the ball game and uh but it wasn't always a big company you know bob dixon and bill sugg and i we used to have contests we were selling putting stuff in the trunk going around and we would have contests to see who could stay in the cheapest motel because there, there was no money you know and uh and the short story of that is two things happened number one browning made us their camo pattern. Yep. And we launched the show nationally on TNN. And Toxie, I'll tell you, that's what put the second story on the office building. It was off to the races. The, the Hunting the Country TV show. That's what you're talking about, right? Yeah, that was a uh, that was a biggie. You know, Toxie called me in his office, and I'd always shot videos and was still doing it because it was fun. Like, if, if I'm asking Dan Schmidt to go turkey hunt with me, I'm going to take the camera and try to film it. That that does a couple of things. It it lets you know that I'm there for a reason because you don't need a guide, neither did any other outdoor writer. And then I would let Will or somebody else use the footage because I got good at filming turkey hunts. But Toxie called me in his office one day, and I'll have to tell you the whole PR story another time, but he was like, we got to have a TV show. And uh, he wasn't talking about Mississippi outdoors, local. He was, so I, he, and he kind of saddled me with that. So I went over to Mississippi State, which is 15 minutes from here, and they have a great production school. I knew wow. I knew I needed. And uh, I met the dean, told him what I was doing, and I was looking out of that class. And I said, "Do any of them people in this class hunt?" And he said, "That big boy right there, he's a big hunter, Stephen Davis. God bless him." So I waited for him, hired him on the spot. And uh, he he and he wasn't even out of college, and he came and we ordered all this old this uh, avid edit stuff. Toxy was convinced, and I was too. We gotta we gotta edit it here. Can't we can't farm that out? Hunting's too controversial in some people's eyes. But Stephen ordered all that stuff, and back then the room looked like NASA. It, it was it was people doing it on their phone and their laptop. Now back then it was giant. Three four inch decks. You remember? Oh, I remember. Monitors. Yeah. And the year that show aired, <clears throat> we put together twelve or thirteen shows. The year it aired, I was in South Dakota in October. We just did October, November, December for the first run, filming a deer hunt. And again, I was a nervous wreck. Said we're going to be the laughing stock. Nobody's going to watch it. Well, the ratings were really big even for a saturday morning show and back then you would air your show you'd get true nielsen ratings on tuesday right and a fa and a fact so you could watch it and uh and it, that really changed the landscape because right after that show where brownie came on board and then we're in the licensing business now <clears throat> but i i have my own personal opinion why the show did so well is because toxie never wanted to be the guy right. nobody did critters 
habitat. And we always did that. When the, a guy from ESPN gave me some great advice, <clears throat> you know, we were only on TNN a couple of years and then they sold the network. <clears throat> so we moved to ESPN. And I was up there meeting <clears throat> with those people. And the guy was, he, he told me, he said, look, cuz I'm going to give you some advice. Good storytelling will never go out of style or great cinematography. So we always tried to tell a story. And I would tell the young video, video videographers, I call them field producers, because they're the most important cog in that chain. <clears throat> if your hunter's not entertaining, focus on the guide. And if the guides don't want to talk or something, I said, focus on the town. Go to the closest little town and make it a little documentary. And we never scored deer. Uh, wasn't about that. That's something I admire about deer and deer hunting. They're, they ain't never been about that. It's it's the average person. And I think that's why it's it stuck for so long. But, uh, hey, I'm just a cameraman. That's a guess <laughs> more than anything. Well, I got I to gotta <clears throat> piggyback on that because um, – when we start, I'm going to jump ahead and then I'm going to jump back. Uh, when we started our TV show, which would have been 19 years ago, uh, right now, uh, we took a page out of, out of what Mossy Oak was doing. And our slogan then, and it is now, it, where the deer are the stars of the show. Like, yeah, yeah, we've got guys hunting on there, but it's like, no, the focus has got to be. And that's what we always said was back to the brand was it's about the deer. It's about the habitat. It's about managing the animal. But I'm going to go back to... I. If I'm correct, this would have been your first year of TV. It could have been either 1995 or 1996 was one of the first times I hunted with you. And mm -hmm. um, it was your Falfurious Texas deer camp. Um, and when I, and I'm looking at that picture behind you, and this one would have almost equaled it. We had, I'm pretty sure it was Nick Sisley, Gary Clancy, Bryce Towsley, Pete Shepley. Yeah. Um uh, 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 oh, Greg, Bob, T Bob Greg, Mac Greg Tinsley, Greg Tinsley, Bob McNally might have been in that. Bunch. Yep, that was that was the all star of and two baseball players, right. Charlie O'Brien and uh, Alex Gonzalez. Yeah, and Travis Fryman was there. Too. That's that right. Was, yeah, that was an unbelievable event. So we're and on I this hunt. You're talking about the old equipment, and I'm hunting with. Uh, oh no, that was the next spring. I'm sorry. The next spring, yeah. you took me on a turkey hunt down there, and my guides were Tack Robinson and Troy Ruiz, who were working for yeah. you at the time. And you're talking about the camera equipment. My, my producers can appreciate this. They had those big freaking whatever those cameras were. Yeah. And it had to be 100 degrees out there, and Troy's carrying his camera. And I said, I said, how hard? I said, I'll carry it. I was the hunter. He gave it to me for like five minutes. I'm like, yeah, no, I gave it right back to him. I'm like, <laughs> I, I said, no, I'll, and, and they called a turkey in for me, and I killed it and filmed it for you guys. But um, I'm just, you're talking about the technology from back in those days to what we have today. We're doing everything with this. You know, I yeah. just, I can't get my, I can't wrap my head around it. But the question for you is, um, you've been to so many, you've, you've hosted so many hunting camps. You've been to so many hunting camps. What makes, in your opinion, a good deer camp? <clears throat> That's an easy question. It's always the people. You know, on a personal level, I, I grew up hunting public land. There's a big public land deal now, which means nothing to me because that's all I ever did. But the first hunting camp I got into, we leased about six or 800 acres from a paper company. And it was not good hunting. It was not close to the Mississippi River. And it was thick. And I but the five guys that were in there with me, it was the most fun ever. <clears throat> Take that into the writer's realm, and that's why I was so uh, intent on being a good host about the food, some entertainment, the transportation, uh, everything being organized. I wanted to be in charge of all of that. Because my mom told me one time, if you go and invite somebody, be a good host. I've never forgot that. But it's always about the people. And it's it's about 99% of the time, especially in that outdoor writer's world, <clears throat> you guys knew each other. Y'all had common goals. I kept that separate. Uh, I always had plenty of props. 
you know, if Dan needed a bow and a muzzle loader or a climber, everybody could go do their thing. You had your little team while you were there, so there was not cross contamination. And uh, what I, the only thing I ever had to watch, because I had everything down to a T, was the people. And I, at one point down there, I had to, that's the only place I ever removed somebody from camp. I don't know if you remember it. It might have been the year after that. I'm not going to say who this person was. You tell the story. I'm going to see if I remember it. <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> I think he was down there to meet one of the sponsors more than anything. But anyway, he's a big-time writer, huge, huge bow hunting guy. And whoever he was wanting to meet wasn't giving him the time of day. That, that was not going to happen. And so he was in a bad mood. I'd pick him up, and he was complaining, this happened, that happened. Food's not okay. And I kept telling him, dude, you calm down. You, you, that's, that's infecting the camp. And it went on and on, and he wouldn't quit. So on, like, the second day in the afternoon or midday, I picked him up, and I had him, I'd already called him, got him a ticket. I think so I remember Pat, this, actually. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, but it, and it, I was scared to death, but I was like, he's – He's ruining everything. Everybody was talking about it. So when I got him in the truck, we passed by the where we were eating, went to this cabin. He said, what's going on? I said, you need to go get your stuff. I got you a ticket out of here. I remember this. Yeah, yeah and he looked at me like, anyway, I took him to the airport, walked in. He never spoke to me, never said anything. I went in, made sure everything was paid for, got him on a plane and left. And then I called Toxie and I said, I'm probably sure you're going to fire me over this, but, you know, I, this is what I did. But that that's how important it was for everybody to have a good time. It doesn't take but one person. You know that. You've been to as many hunting camps or, as me, if not more. But, uh, it, yeah, it's always about the people because hunting can be good. It can be bad. The weather can and some of the best camps I ever had were not in great places or the weather was bad, but it was sitting inside with these like-minded people listening to their stories and struggles. And I always found that fascinating. I, I've always been a big fan of the outdoor press. And Toxie will tell you right out of the gate, that's what built Mossy Oak because there was no internet, social you media. You guys were slash. the influencers. You guys were the in yeah. influencers of the day. And I think even like anybody who's doing it now, there's bits and pieces. Yeah, Mossy was there. There were other companies that were doing it. We know Realtree did it. We know other uh, HS had a big pro staff. Um, but that was <clears throat> that's how I think a lot of this stuff started to what we're modeling uh, content after today. Yeah, it was, uh, it was you know, Toxie called me in his office one day. And I tell you who was great at it was Harold and David, not yes. Hale. They were just the best. And Toxie was, he, he he pulled me in there and he was showing me articles and photos and stuff. And that's what they were doing is bringing people up to their stuff there. And he said, that we, we got to have a PR program like that. And he, he just kept on and on. And he said, you're, you're the right guy for this. I don't have time. You're a better people person. I said, I'm in. What's PR stand for? <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't know what he's talking about. But, uh, you know, I, I met Harold and David and John Phillips, bless him. He was one of the best. Bubba was at that guys. camp too, yep. Yeah. He, he he gave me so much good advice about, you know, their, about having props there and keeping people separated. And and I just love to, to wait on people. And, if you, and I told people from the get-go, hey, I don't care what you do when you're not here. When you're in our camp, wear our stuff. But whatever you got to do to make a living, do it. And if I can help in any way, let me know. And those were the best relationships that I've ever had because uh, we were all kind of building this industry together. You know, I, I would help the writers, and then I'd get a call from somebody saying, uh, oh, so-and-so is doing a camo piece. Why don't you call him? It's all about networking, which was really important back then. Yep. Deer Talk Now is brought to you by... With more than 70 years of experience in the animal health and nutrition industries, Analogics Outdoors brings its unique expertise to the science of deer feed and attractants. For more information, visit analogics.com. Let me ask you this. What was the first... Actually, Brad asked me to ask you this. What was the first bow you used when you killed your first deer? <clears throat> Well, that's a, you know, I started way, but 
as the there wasn't any compound bows. I said it was probably a recurve, yeah. and he said it was in probably mid- an Allen, but I wasn't sure. Yeah, I, I can remember. I had a couple of different recurves. We had, my dad started this thing. You talking about forward thinking? He was a military, he's twenty year army guy, and then he was the sports editor for our newspaper. But they formed a thing called the Junior Sportsman's Club there in Natchez, and it was for kind of underprivileged kids whose dad wasn't taking them hunting. We did all kind of cool stuff, rabbit hunting and trot lines. But we had some bare recurve bows, and I absolutely fell in love with that. So before I even had my driver's license, 13, 14, I would tag along with my brother and go to the home and the National Forest and it. And I never did kill a deer with a recurve. I was just, I was not a good shot. I, not with that, not instinctive. I couldn't, but anyway, I found this bow and it wasn't an Allen. It was an Indian yep. stalker, yep. a little black bow. Yep. And it didn't have a string. The cable just ran and you put your knocking point on the string, but it had a sight pin built into the riser. And I figured that 20 yard side out and went, man, I'm going to kill every deer in the county. And uh, that's the first deer I killed was with that little Indian stalker. Wow. Funny you say that. I was digging some pictures of you out because <laughs> I'm going to have you on my podcast. <laughs> and I found a picture of you with a dart. That was my first boat. That was my first compound that I owned. It was a dart and so, trail master. My, uh, my best bow, my most favorite bow ever. Back then, I thought I was Chuck Adams. I bought a dart and SL-50. And I'm telling you, that thing was amazing. When I saw you holding that dart and bow, I said, that's that's my brother from another mother. That right was there. it. And I had, I think it was a real tree uh, onesie jumpsuit. I remember, I remember it like it was yesterday. We drove to a sporting goods store, my buddy and I. Uh, it was about 30 miles west of Milwaukee. And they had army camouflage and they had the tree bark jumpsuits. And I'm like, well, I don't have to buy a pants and I can get it all in one thing, you know. And I bought that trail master. I think it was, I was working three jobs, grocery store, gas station, and construction. And it was $150 for the bow with arrows and broadheads. And I'm like, well, that's all I can spend, you know. That's a lot of money. Uh, Well, man, that was like, that broke me. But I I had it. And then it took all the way until I, I made all the mistakes until I got up here. So let's talk about that. Is, is bow hunting, this is kind of a loaded question. Is bow hunting that much easier today than it was then yeah it was yeah i, th- I think it's a lot harder nowadays because there's so many choices it seems like everybody's in a camp you're either in the the heavy weighted air on the front end camp or the high arrow speed camp or the i can shoot 100 yards camp none of that was uh, you didn't have to deal with any of that back then your your gear was so limited you know you had a bare razor head and then Savar came up with a, a razor head. It was uh, Eastern Game Getter arrows with five inch feathers. And uh, there was like two sizes 2018, 2117. I see you nodding your head. Yep, 2117. That's what I had. But you know what? Once you, you, once you got proficient, you didn't worry about much other than over 20 yards. And, and then you got to concentrate on finding deer sign. It, that made you a way better hunter because there was no food plots. It was all acorn trees or push points or bottlenecks or whatever it was. But it was it was way simpler. And, you know, I, I craved to have my grandsons feel that, but they never will because they have too much information in front of them and too many influencers. And there's nothing wrong with social media. I'll go down that road if you want to, but uh to go through what we went through as the industry itself was being birthed man that was a special time and it was it was so let me say it like this it was so much less about the bow and more about the honey once you know because there wasn't that much to pick from but man it was it was much simpler back then and the deer were not really educated especially to a hunter up in a tree stand no if you were lucky enough to see one and get it in range, you could kill it. Same, same way with Tom Kelly talking about turkeys. He was he was telling me stories, and I was just in awe. 
And I think he said it was 1953. He never heard a turkey. He went every day wow. before work. Now, how many people you know would do that? They do it for anyway, one day. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but he said, you know, because if you heard one, you could kill it. It was much easier. He said, you didn't hear many, but they didn't hear any hunters. And I said, well, that makes sense. He said, if you could get one in close. And, but it's the same way with deer hunting. Yeah, it's a, it's a much, much different game now. And uh, I have a pretty big social media footprint for an old guy. So I get a lot of comments. And you'll, you'll get, the, and I don't get many negatives, but you'll get the occasional, you know, I don't use a crossbow or I don't use a ground blind and all that. But everybody's, uh, had a different path. Not everybody had three jobs like me and you. And uh, if they were ever around those, some of those wounded vets I, that we take, and I can take that blind and just set it over that wheelchair, or you got your six, five-year-old grandson in there moving and still seeing deer and his eyes are that big. Man, I, the older I get, the slower I am to make a decision on anything. Cause it's like, and the, and I'm sure it's because of you, but deer and deer hunting's been like that since the get-go. It's one of the reasons I'm such a big fan. It's you know, I don't forget about Bubba who drives a gravel truck down at the county yard, or that lady checking groceries at the grocery store. To me, that's about let's 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 in, let's let's get everybody enthused, not just the guy. I looked at a bowl of wine the other day. Cause I, mine's like eight or nine years old and I still love it. And I ain't going to buy one. I was just looking, it was like 1800 bucks. Yep. And I was like, are you kidding? I didn't pay $1,800 for the first brand new vehicle I bought. But, and, and again, I don't live in the past, but somebody asked me, we were at ATA and it's been three or four years ago about, well, what are you looking for? What do you think we should do? I said, if it's me and I had an archery company, I would I would I would take every dime I had and I would build a compound and a crossbow for $199 and let's see how many people we can get in the woods. Now, some people cringe going, we don't need any more people in the woods. But you you got to be enthused to kind of pass that on. And I mean that's a podcast by itself. How do you do that? But uh to, to get back to your original question it's way harder now just because of the decisions and the options. <laughs> I agree with you. I mean, yes, we probably, I don't know if we have more deer than we did when I started. I know it was 30 million deer in America then. It's 32 million now. But I just think the the pressure, um, you know, deer are smarter. I mean, yes, we're doing other things. We got food plots now. We didn't really have too many. I mean, I know you guys in the South had them. Before we had them up here, it was kind of a novel thing. But um, I want to get to a point that you were talking about there is you were talking about, and I know you guys do a lot with the vets, which is awesome, but you have been very big on mentorship with youth. And um, if you had to give a dad, a mom, a grandpa, somebody advice, because I know you've seen a lot of it, what are some of the things that somebody can do to not only introduce a kid to hunting, but keep them interested? Yeah, I, you know, I tell people all the time, <clears throat> and I've got a pretty good vision of this because I, I, I've done so many sports shows and camps and wild game suppers and all this. You see the, the full gamut. And now, <clears throat> you know, my what I would rather do than anything is, is, and is find a person, a grown person with a driver's license, especially if they got kids. And, and, and commit to them for a week or two weeks to get them just everything they need to know. And there's a lot of them out there because they can keep going. If you take a kid and his parents don't hunt, say he's 10 years old, and you get him all fired up. Well, when you're done, he's done. So I, I try to get those parents involved and all that. The, the NDA, formerly QDMA, has done a marvelous job reaching those people because they're out there with the uh, – they're all about wanting to know where their food came from and all that. But as far as kids, I've got a good perspective too, because I had my kids and I've run the camp, the grandkids through the whole thing. And they're, you know, they're teenagers now. But the first thing I've got to tell them, I tell everybody, you got to check your ego at the door, dad, because you, you want it to happen 
for so many reasons, mostly yourself. You got to you got to throw all that out and say, look, this ain't about me. It's about them. And you got to find out. I had girls, so I would pick the day. You know, it was like 65 degrees. I wouldn't go when it was bitter cold. I would take a big piece of blind material, some Barbie dolls. And I just wanted them to be out in the woods. And I didn't care if they became hunters. I wanted them to, number one, know where food comes from. And if you're eating protein, something died. Don't ever, don't ever go down that path. Mm-hmm. And I just wanted them to, to know the the lingo around the supper table. As it ended out, they as it ended up, they had a great time. Both of them married men that hunt, their kids hunt. But what you got to understand, it ain't about you; it's about them. The worst thing I see people do is is make it tough on them. You got to sit still for three hours. No, you don't. Build you a shooting house out of pallets or plywood or something, and then let them take snacks. They're going to bring their phone, deal with it. I, my deal with mine when they were little is like 4.30, phone gets put up, and we're going to, we're going to whisper and talk and look. <clears throat> the, number, the number two thing I saw was, and this is a big deal, is they would overgun that little kid. Because I, I, I started these with BB guns, and I had a both action twenty two. It looked just like the bolt action two two three, because that first uh, gun kick, all that noise and that recoil, if that's a really bad experience, they're going to carry that for a long yep. time. And I've seen them, you know, there'll be a little nine year old kid there with a three oh eight or something. I'm going, golly, that's, and maybe they're fine with it, but I always felt like that was a a really big deal. And and then if you're going to to guide them, teach them. You know, my, my girls would love to look at a whatever, stop and see that spider web or that mushroom or that stuff. But that time is so important, especially with your kids, because, like I said, I had girls and that we would talk about stuff in the deer blind that they would never talk to me about at home because it was uh, unencumbered time, I guess. But, yeah, make it fun for them. Ask them, you know, and I've taken countless kids and countless first timers. I, it's, it's, that that list goes on and on. But I always ask them what they like, what kind of snacks you want, this kind of stuff, and make sure I had a good hunting story about why we do that. But uh, it's uh, it's mainly you know just leave your ego at the door and, and figure out hey this is about them. Maybe we go eat breakfast afterwards if you make it fun. I, I I'll tell you this if you make it fun and they want to go a second time. They're hooked. They are hooked, and I I agree with you 100% because what I always said is let go of the outcome. Um, don't worry about actually killing a deer. I, I said yeah. there's a lot of times you'll get out there for five minutes, and you, you'll realize we're not seeing a deer today. But when one thing you said about, like, looking at a spider web or mushrooms, I would do that with my kids. They would look at a tree as we were walking, and most people would say, no, no, don't look at that. And, I, and they'd say, well, what kind of tree is that? And I would – use that as a teaching lesson. Like, well, that's a yeah. shag bark hickory or that's a silver maple. And I would was shocked years later, they'll say, well, that's a, you know, that is a, um, a white spruce because the needles are, and dad taught me that. I'm like, gosh, I never thought you would have picked up on that, you know? Yeah. Um, but it's those a- little things. This episode is also brought to you by Traditions, as you probably know, two years ago, they came out with the Nitro Fire in collaboration with Federal Premium and Hodgeton. The fire stick, they shoot through those guns. This has really changed muzzleloading. It's made it more safer, more accurate. Check them out today at traditionsfirearms.com. I'll tell you a quick story. Sometimes I cry when I tell you this, but when my youngest daughter, Lauren, who produces my podcast, edited a lot of the Hunting the Country, she was about six maybe six and we were at bent creek they used to we used to go over there before the rut they would just say cuz y'all come hang out it's january's the time to be there and it had just rained and lauren and i were walking down this logging road going to a food plot where they have a shooting house on the ground that's just what they do it's a great place to take kids and i was being uh, i was feeling all like i'm the big bad dad and i stopped and i i sniffed her i said lauren you smell that she said what i said that's outside. You can't smell that anywhere else. 
and we just kept on. Never thought about it again. Fast forward 10 years, we had a hunt down there with John Anoni with some kids from Camp Compass. Now Lauren's at 16. She's one of the guides. And I've, I got that big heavy camera. I'm just, I'm just filming. There was three of us filming down there. And they're walking down the road. And Lauren's got her kids, about 10. And she stops and she says this. And I'm telling you, I almost had to drop down to my knees. I couldn't believe she remembered that. It's, uh, it's like you said, it's in little things. That is an awesome story. That is, that <laughs> is like one of those one of those life moments that they'll take with them for always. I got to ask you two more questions yet, because they're on the list here. Um, you had talked about uh, specifically the QDMA, which is now the National Deer Association. Let's separate the association from the concept because I, it's been something that's been talked about. Quality deer management. I know you guys were big with it for all the years. Um, has there been a shift away from quality deer management? Is it still, um, a viable practice in America? No, it, you know, it's, it's a viable practice. Some people took it to the extreme and, you know, it's like when I finally got my little farm and I had a County guy out there and he was talking about, you can do this and you can't do that. And I was like, I ain't doing any of that. Here's my goal. My goal is to have maximum carrying capacity. Cause I got three or four grandsons, my wife, daughters. I, I said, I want to hunt these people. I want them to see deer. And some people took it and made it into a competition. And QDMA was never about growing a giant rack. It never was. And it was about deer health, habitat, how many you could sustain. And it got into aging deer. You know, if you don't want to shoot a two year old, I'm down with that. If you don't want, you want to wait till they're four or five, that's good but not everybody has that option, you know? So I, I think QDMA as it started, we needed that because down here, the hunting was really good down here, up and down the rivers, you know that. And you could see back in the day, you'd see 30 deer and then two four points because nobody would shoot a doe. And if the, the main thing that QDMA did started harvesting some does it, it, it's more fun to see rack bucks and those than just those and spikes and four points. But yeah, I think it's a viable practice and, it, and it's still used. It's like everything else in this country. You know, they took the Model A Ford, now it's a monster truck. It costs $300,000. <laughs> People tend to, Americans are, boy, they're gun ho. But yeah, it's a, it's a great thing. And people have, uh, made their habitat better, especially private landowners. And uh, my, my deal is be all inclusive. I tell people all the time, if you buy a hunting license and you go by the rules, then we're, we're teammates. Now you start breaking the rules, that's an issue, but there's uh, certainly room for everybody. Everybody does it different. One of the, the best hunting experiences I ever had was up in your world, up in Wisconsin, when I went up with Joel Slater from Ram and I got, I was on a mission to kill a deer up there on public <laughs> land. And guess what? It took me four seasons. Wow. Going up there a week. It, 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 hunting in those giant evergreen forests where you can't hear it. It was, it was the coolest thing ever. And because one reason I, I, I always wanted to hunt somewhere where I had to put my license on my back. <laughs> I used to see that. You guys. We don't have to do that anymore, though. But yeah, what we did well, back in the day. <laughs> I, I thought that was the coolest thing ever. So it, it, there's there's rednecks everywhere. Everybody's the same. The accents are different. The recipes are different. But those people that love to hunt are the same. And until you go experience that. I was up there one time with him and went to a a grill slash bar on a Monday night and the Packers were playing on Monday. I've never seen anything like that in my life <laughs> and, and had more fun, but it's like, Hey, we're, we're all, we're all in this together. We're all in this together. One last question. <laughs> this is right up your alley because I knew you, well, you started off as a, as a turkey eating up with turkey hunting. Uh, yes. What, it, what has happened with our wild turkey populations in America? You know, it's funny you bring that up. I went to the Turkey Symposium last year in North Carolina, Asheville, 
and that's all biologists and scientists and researchers. Matter of fact, I had my phone sitting out on thesaurus the whole time because there were some big words coming out. <laughs> and I listened to Dr. Mike Chamberlain. I listened to everybody. And they had a question and answer thing at the end. And they asked uh, Dr. Chamberlain, hey, is it, was it COVID related? Did we have too many hunters in the woods? Is it uh, intrusion? And is, is it habitat destruction? Is it disease? And he, he, he simply answered yes. And uh, it, it's probably a little bit of everything. It's very regional. Some, some areas are impacted worse than others. You know, my own personal belief is, uh, you know, it's really hard for a hen to raise a clutch. There's, everything's trying to eat it. They have to spend three or four days on the ground when they're that little full egg flop. It's tough. So it ain't like, you know, killing six does off your 200 acres. It's, it can be impactful. I, I think during COVID, there was a lot more people turkey hunting. And our techniques have gotten better. The gear's gotten better. I told a guy that some guy got on me about shooting TSS ammo, the Apex stuff. And I was like, you know what? I have maybe, as much as I go, personally, I may have two, three opportunities to kill a turkey in a whole season. And I want it to be the best I can. And I'm not going to shoot one at 60 or 70 yards, but they can certainly do it now. I, yeah. know, I know you're good. You, you've seen what you can do yep. with a tight choke and that stuff. So the dip, the big difference to me is same, maybe same number of encounters, but the dead turkeys coming out of the woods are that, that, that percentage is way higher now than it used to be. It used to be 20 yards, 25 right. yards. You, you shoot them with number fours and run out there after them. But here's the, here's the upside to that. I say this all the time. It's just like anything else. If, if the critter we're talking about, it's legal to hunt in the U.S., we'll figure out what's wrong because nothing's going to end up on the endangered species that we covet so much. So I don't really talk about that stuff a lot, CWD or all that, because I know I can see behind the scenes people working and raising money. Hey, let's figure it out. Let's, let's see what's going on and let's correct it. And that's the great thing, as Ted Nugent says, they ain't doing that in France. We're doing that. <laughs> Right. So when, uh, I, I think the outcome is uh, going to be bright. I do, too. I agree with you. And I agree with you on the uh, uh, some of the problems. Um, and I just recommend if you're not trapping to either start trapping or allow people to trap on your property because, uh, you know, raccoons, possums, they need to be managed just as just as much as anything else. Yeah, especially the raccoons. They had a study, and I'll, I'll just give you the high point real quick. They did a study on two plots of land. One, in, I think one was in North Florida, the other in southeast Georgia. And they had uh, video trail cameras on 70-something nests. And they had college kids out there. They found, anyway, the uh, I think it was the North Florida acreage, 100% got torn up. Wow. One one hundred percent of the nest and I think seventy eight percent of that was coons. Really? Yes, sir. It was it was amazing information. So yeah. Uh yeah, I talk about trapping. I did a PSA for our state agency on trapping, you know, and it's a big deal. But you gotta do the work just like anything else, you know. They look at Dan now going, Oh, he's the man. Well, you didn't know him back there when he was working at a gas station in a grocery no, store. No, yeah, no. Do, you got to do the work. work. You got to do the work. Something. One thing you told me that your mama told you is that good things happen to good people, and uh, you're obviously yeah. a good person because a lot of good things have <laughs> happened to you over the years. And I deserve none of them. I'm telling you, I have been around. I've been around some of the greatest people, and uh, never was scared to ask questions and. Uh, man, it's been a blessing. I was lucky enough to grow up in an era where you guys were making your mark, and uh, I got to be a part of that. And uh, I don't take any of that for granted, I promise you. Likewise here. Well, thank you, my friend. Um, very much appreciate catching up with you and, and taking a few minutes out to join us today. 
All right, I'm going to put it on my bucket list that you and I are going to share camp again soon. That would be awesome. I would really appreciate that, and I would I have a lot of fun. And we might have to have you up here because we still have a few turkeys up here. So, I And that's that's an open invite to hunt Brad's property, just so you know. <laughs> uh -oh. He's got right. better land tell, than I've got. <laughs> all right, tell Brad to turn his cameras on. I may show up at his driveway. <laughs> all right. <laughs> His name is Ronnie Cuz Strickland. His podcast is a uh, Mossy Oaks Fistful of Dirt. You can catch that wherever podcasts are dropped or watched on uh, social media. Same thing here. Deer Talk Now, every Thursday, produce an episode. Find them wherever podcasts are dropped or uh, mainly on the video versions if you want to watch those, YouTube and Facebook. So for Ronnie Cuz Strickland, I am Dan Schmidt. We will catch you next week for another episode of Deer Talk Now. Deer Talk Now is brought to you by 10 Point Crossbow Technologies. Whether I'm in a tree stand, ground blind, or spot and stalk hunting, I know the Nitro 505 is up to any challenge. Check one out at a dealer near you or log on to 10pointcrossbows.com for more information.